Canada's parliament just accused China of committing genocide. But Prime Minister Justin Trudeau doesn't quite agree. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Today, we're going to be talking about genocide and why it's so hard to identify. It's almost as if when an authoritarian regime purposefully tries to destroy a group of people, they also want to hide the evidence and lie about it. Earlier this week, Canada's parliament declared China's treatment of the Uyghurs genocide. That's pretty significant making Canada the second country after the U.S. to officially use the G word. The motion was brought by Canada's Conservative Party, and Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole said it was needed to send a clear and unequivocal signal that we will stand up for human rights and the dignity of human rights, even if it means sacrificing some economic opportunity. And while standing up for human rights shouldn't be controversial, it was very controversial. The motion passed the House of Commons by 266 to 0. Okay, that doesn't sound controversial. But more than 70 MPs either abstained or missed the vote, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his entire cabinet. Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Garneau was the only cabinet minister present. When it was his turn, he said he abstained on behalf of the government of Canada. By the government of Canada, he means the prime minister and the cabinet, what the U.S. would call the executive branch. Parliament was voting on a non-binding resolution. That means it officially recognized the genocide, but it didn't actually require the government to do anything about it. The House of Commons is just saying that they recognize the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide. They're also calling on the IOC to move the Olympics if it doesn't stop, and for the Canadian government to officially call it genocide. Yeah, I'm going to say those last two things are probably not going to happen. You see, ahead of the vote, Justin Trudeau had called genocide an extremely loaded term. And he said, when it comes to the application of the very specific word genocide, we simply need to ensure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before a determination like that is made. Sure, that sounds reasonable. But it's not like the House of Commons declared the Chinese Communist Party's actions against the Uyghurs a genocide just because they felt like it. Last October, a House of Commons subcommittee on international human rights declared that the actions of the Chinese Communist Party constitute genocide as laid out in the UN Genocide Convention. That was based on evidence from hearings they held in 2018 and 2020. That evidence included dozens of hours of testimony from academics, civil society, and witnesses who survived the atrocities in Xinjiang. So it sounds like they dotted some I's and crossed some of their T's there. Trudeau is right that genocide is a serious accusation to make. And that's because genocide is an evil act. After the horrors of the Holocaust, the world said, never again. But there's a problem with Trudeau not using the word genocide. I'll explain after the break. Welcome back. Justin Trudeau doesn't want to officially declare that what the Chinese Communist Party is doing to the Uyghurs is genocide. But here's the thing. It's really hard to stop authoritarian regimes from committing genocide. So it's up to the rest of the world to pretend those regimes are not committing genocide. I like to call it, let's pretend it never happens again. If you just gloss over a few words, it's almost like never again. Let's call it never dot 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 again, for short. And some of Trudeau's justifications for not calling out the Chinese Communist Party's genocide sound like never dot 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 again. Like when he said that instead of Canada calling it a genocide by itself, the best way to move forward is multilaterally. Sure, multilateralism sounds good, 
but it actually benefits the Chinese Communist Party. They love it because they can just use their influence over one of the countries in your multilateral coalition to stop you from doing anything. It's their specialty. Like they did when they got Greece to block an EU statement on China's human rights. The other issue with waiting for multilateralism is that if every country waits to declare it a genocide until other countries also declare it a genocide, then no one is ever going to declare it a genocide. It's like you say you want to work out with your friends, except you decide that no one can go to the gym unless everyone goes to the gym. Guess what? No one will ever go to the gym. But maybe that was your plan all along, because you hate going to the gym. Just like a lot of governments hate criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. But speaking of multilateralism, the House of Commons resolution actually addressed this issue. They noted that Canada tries to work with allies when recognizing genocide, and then cited the fact that two different U.S. administrations have agreed that the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide. So if this is something both Biden and Trump can agree on, Maybe Canada can as well. That's why the Canadian House of Commons used the U.S. Declaration of Genocide to back up their own. And now that both the U.S. and Canada have called it a genocide, it makes it easier for other countries to do the same. Maybe Australia will be next. Or Great Britain. Or German, never mind. But what if multilateralism isn't enough? Here's another great never dot 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 again excuse. We need to have an independent investigation in China to look into those claims of genocide. That's basically what Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Garneau said. He's the guy who abstained from the genocide vote on behalf of the Trudeau government. Garneau said the government takes allegations against China very seriously and has raised its concerns directly with the Chinese government. Yeah, that'll show them. Garneau said Canada wants independent investigators to go into China to document abuses and is working with international partners to gain access to the region. Hey, that's a great idea. Maybe those independent investigators can be sent by some international body dedicated to human rights like the UN Human Rights Council. I'm sure that China, which sits on the Human Rights Council, would definitely let that happen in a totally independent way. Look, I'm not saying there shouldn't be independent investigations into the genocide of Uyghurs. In fact, the evidence of genocide has come from years of investigations and research from journalists, academics, and human rights advocates and especially from Uyghur activists themselves. And we've covered that over the years on this show. But let's get real. The Chinese Communist Party is never going to let an actual independent investigation happen in China. Even if they let investigators into Xinjiang, it would be exactly like the show tour they gave to the BBC. As hundreds of thousands of Muslims disappear into giant secure facilities, China has begun taking a few selected journalists inside. This is what it wants the world to see. See, that's not genocide. That's happy ethnic dancing. Case closed. By the way, if you want to hear what it was like to be given one of the Communist Party's show tours, check out this episode of our podcast, China Unscripted, where we talk to an Albanian journalist who visited those concentration camps. It's a crazy story. But the point is, if you're going to wait for an independent investigation in China before you decide whether they're committing genocide, you're never going to call it genocide. But maybe that was your plan all along. Now, a lot of these controversies also came up when former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo 
declared what was happening in Xinjiang both crimes against humanity and a genocide. Most recently, Foreign Policy published an article about how State Department lawyers concluded there was insufficient evidence to prove genocide in China. Basically, the State Department lawyers determined that the Chinese Communist Party was definitely committing crimes against humanity. And the lawyers didn't say that there wasn't genocide, but that legally speaking, there may not be enough evidence to prove there was genocide in court. But the article goes on to say that some legal experts disagree with the narrow definition used by the State Department lawyers, and say there's ample evidence that China has engaged in genocide. In any case, while the lawyers can advise the Secretary of State, he makes the final decision, and Pompeo declared it a genocide. During his confirmation hearing, current Secretary of State Antony Blinken said he stands by Pompeo's designation of genocide, although there are also reports that the Biden administration is currently reviewing that genocide designation. Both the State Department and the Canadian Parliament's designation of genocide rely on the UN Genocide Convention. It says that genocide is any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national ethnical, racial, or religious group. That includes killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. When most people think of genocide, we think of mass murder, like what happened in Rwanda. But according to the UN, it includes other attempts to destroy a group as well. And according to this definition, the Chinese Communist Party's torture and brainwashing of Uyghurs, their forced sterilization of Uyghur women, their separation of Uyghur children from their parents, would all count as genocide. But maybe, it shouldn't count as genocide. That's the incredibly brave argument that The Economist is making. Why is The Economist arguing that we shouldn't call it a genocide? I'll get to that after the break. Welcome back. The Economist argues that we shouldn't call China's genocide a genocide. You see, just as homicide means killing a person, and suicide means killing yourself, genocide means killing a people. China's persecution of the Uyghurs is horrific, but it's not slaughtering them. Okay, economist, first of all, yes, it is slaughtering them, for their organs. But please, continue with your argument. I want to see where this is going. Until now, America's State Department had applied the genocide label only to mass slaughter, and even then, it often hesitated, for fear that uttering the term would create an expectation that it would intervene. It did not call Rwanda's genocide a genocide until it was practically over. Hold on. I'm pretty sure it was a huge mistake for the U.S. not to call Rwanda's genocide a genocide until it was practically over. It's not an example of what we should keep doing. But go on. By accusing China of genocide, the U.S. is sending the signal that its government has committed the most heinous of crimes. And yet at the same time, it is proposing to deal with it over global warming, pandemics, and trade. Yes, I agree this is a problem, but maybe there's another solution to this that doesn't involve changing the definition of genocide. Here's the thing. In their truly despicable article, The Economist makes a good point. How can other countries accuse the Chinese Communist Party of genocide and still treat them like a normal government? That's the fundamental problem with recognizing the Uyghur genocide. If we start using the G word, then why don't we treat China like Rwanda or Sudan? How can we have the Olympics there without it turning into the Genocide Olympics? 
How can we trade with China? How can we have state visits? How can we unleash the potential of Chinese bonds? Don't we all become complicit in genocide? Well, yes, we are all complicit in genocide. The world has gone from never again to let's pretend it never happens again. But as long as governments can do the diplomatic equivalent of shoving their fingers in their ears and going la 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 la, they will still do business with the Chinese Communist Party. But guess what? The genocide isn't going to go away just because we keep doing business with them. In fact, a new independent tribunal has formed in the UK to investigate whether the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide. It's chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice. He's the same guy who chaired the China Tribunal on Forced Organ Harvesting. That tribunal determined that China had been killing prisoners of conscience for their organs for years, including both Falun Gong practitioners and the Uyghurs. Forced organ harvesting, by the way, is a big elephant in the room when it comes to the genocide designation. As more governments acknowledge that the Chinese regime is committing genocide, the evidence of organ harvesting becomes harder to deny. And as more evidence emerges that the Chinese Communist Party is killing Uyghurs for their organs, it will get harder for The Economist or Justin Trudeau to claim there's no mass killing going on. And Western governments might have to actually ask themselves, should we really be pumping money into China? which is why the Chinese Communist Party absolutely hates all this talk of genocide. Their state-run media are trying to discredit it as much as possible. And if Chinese state-run media wants us to keep quiet about something, you know it's precisely something we should all be talking about. And now, it's time for me to answer a question from a fan who supports the show on the crowdfunding website Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash chinancensored to learn more. Weish asks, Chris and team, are videos of coerced confessions effective propaganda? Are the Chinese people really fooled by them? Well, Weish, it depends on what you mean by effective propaganda. Do Chinese people believe that these people are making genuine confessions about their crimes? I would say they probably generally know these confessions are coerced, especially if they're older and lived through the Cultural Revolution. But that doesn't mean these forced confessions aren't effective. Even if people don't believe in the content of the confessions, they know that they don't want to be the ones making a forced confession themselves. Which means they don't want to cross the Chinese Communist Party. And that's the most effective tool of all. Thanks for your question, Weish. And thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.